Well, I thank all of you. It's an incredible honor to be here with you today to talk about Internet governance, the Internet ecosystem, and where things might be headed. And it's a particular honor to be here at CSIS, and I thank uh, Dr. James Lewis, or as I like to refer to him as Jim, because of the tremendous work that he's done in cybersecurity, certainly one of the leading global thinkers and conveners to pull together the report for the 44th presidency. And we all know how complex and contentious that topic can be. And to herd all the minds and cats uh, in, in this city on, on that topic was extremely impressive and it was masterfully done. And, and, and therefore, I'm honored to be here because I'm hoping that Jim and the center will begin to look at issues globally of Internet governance, uh, as well as the role that ICANN and other players uh, play in the future, because it's part of an unfolding uh, 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 saga that we humans are going through and developing, and it's, and it's a place that we've never been before. So great appreciation to Jim. And also, I want to st uh, start with a quote from one of my mentors whom I treasure dearly. And this mentor would always remind me if I ever thought that we were converging on the solution to a problem or a model or understanding something, he would always say, Rod, please remember, all of us are smarter than any of us. And I don't know if any of you know who said that to me, but it was William F. Sharp, the Nobel Prize winner who sat on the board of CAT Software, our company, for about five years, a brilliant man, and the father of indexing and finance, which has created the indexing that we track now and said you should index invest because individuals are, it's hard to beat the market. It's hard to beat, beat the wisdom of crowds. And the same is true in internet governance. And the same is true in this domain that we're in. And so we all need to help each other and work together on this problem. So today, I'm not going to have any grand solutions for you. I'm not going to have any bullet points that are going to solve the problems. We're going to explore the issue of Internet governance. We're going to explore where we are, a bit of where we've been, and to, so we can all begin to think where might we wish to go in the future. It's also quite fitting that we're here at the Center for Strategic International Studies. Why? Well, why was the center created? The center was created to help the United States of America uh, uh, sustain and, and avoid a nuclear disaster. That was the original goal of the center and this institution. So it was designed to avoid a nuclear disaster. Now, why is that relevant to the Internet? Well, as you know, part of the mythology of the Internet and part of the story that's told is that the Internet was designed to be this masterful decentralized network that could not even be destroyed in nuclear war. But as one of the fathers of the Internet and the original co-authors of the Internet Protocols in the room, I can maybe give you part of the broader story. And that's Dr. Robert Kahn, of course, uh, one of the original two authors of TCPIP, or the, the Core Internet Protocol, and the founding contract manager, DARPA, of the DARPANET that led to the Internet. And it's an honor to have you and to, to be with you here today, Dr. Kahn. And the true story that, uh, that Bob told me once is that it wasn't really, that wasn't really the reason the network was designed. That was just a great way to sell it to DOD. Okay, so because if you look at the internet, the, re the original design was done because hard disk space was so expensive. I think it was roughly a million dollars a megabyte or something like that. And researchers wanted to share that resource, those expensive hard disks, across university campuses and other sites. And they needed to build a network that could reach across their networks so that they could share this precious resource called a hard disk. So the internet was designed as a sharing platform for information. And, but part of the, one of the benefits of this de decentralized design was that it was, in fact, able to withstand a nuclear attack. There's another way that it's related to the history of this institution and, and why CSIS is so relevant for where the Internet's going, which is what does the Internet have in common with the nuclear situation today? There's many things it does not have in common. Okay? And many people are drawing the wrong parallels. People are saying, well, if we're going to look at cyber deterrence or how we handle the Internet, let's go look at the nuclear arms race and deterrence and, uh, and all the policies and the norms that developed. But in fact, they're quite dissimilar fundamentally because nuclear weapons are very expensive. There's relatively few of them held by very few centrally controlled parties, namely nation states and governments. They're pretty easy to identify by a site or with a Geiger counter. Okay, uh, and so they're controlled, they're centralized, and I mean, who in this country can use them? No, one person, right? The President of the United States. So nuclear weapons are extremely centralized, 
In addition, if we look at nuclear weapons, how often have they been used in the last 60 years? Zero times, thank goodness, okay? If we look at cyber, if we look at the internet, how often is the internet used? Well, the domain name system that we work with, the domain name system alone, has over one trillion transactions a day. If you look at cybersecurity, there are over one billion attempts to test what's open and vulnerable in cybersecurity globally per day. I actually think the number is probably closer to five to 10 billion per day. So the nuclear world is very different than the, than, uh, than the internet and the cyber world. But here's what's similar, and some, some seeds of thoughts here. What's similar between this nuclear world is the proliferation of nuclear weapons led us to what recognition? MAD, right? Mutual Assured Destruction, right? And we used to have the fire drill, the dr drills in school jumping below our desk as though that would do something. But what did Mutual Assured Destruction lead to? Peace and stability. Why? In game theory, there was no win. There was no win. And so the world and even hostile nations had to learn how to collaborate, even though they might not wish to collaborate. And there might be some lessons there for us on the internet and where we are today. So cyber is a very different phenomenon. We are moving, even with the internet, to having our economies totally based and dependent upon this internet infrastructure. And clearly, we could lead to a cyber mutual assured destruction or at least countries and parties could shut down power grids, the electrical systems, the industrial complex, which actually then touches the water system, and so much that we know. So this thing is spreading incredibly. That observation reminds us of part of the reality of this new world, which is incredible interdependence. From those seeds of interdependence were born a set of processes within the internet, which, which wasn't focused on the negative side of damage that could be done initially, it was shaped on the positive side of sharing, as people wanted to share information and expand this network. So it's very fitting we're here at CSIS that was born out of the nuclear problem and concern, which in ways was used to justify the investment in the DARPAnet and the internet itself, and which today in some very funny ways may actually have some parallels with some of the challenges we face and might inform us in how we seek to, to move forward. You know, Victor Hugo once said, a stand can be made against any invasion by an army, but no stand can be made against the invasion of an idea. And the idea of the internet has been absolutely irresistible and unstoppable since it's appeared. And why? Because it works. And because the benefits of plugging into this network are so great for the participants that they simply do not choose to use alternatives. And this network not only connects certainly every single person in this room today and anyone who's watching this subsequently because they're tied through an IP network into the broadcast and the television system, there's 1.7 billion users today at least on computers of the internet. And there's three and a half billion people in the world or more who have cell phones, almost all of which now touch IP networks. Because the browsers that we think of about it and the web we think of as the internet, the web is not the internet, it's an application on the internet. The internet is, what is the internet? It is a network of networks. It's another important thing to remember is people talk about, well, the, in, the, 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 the internet's an end-to-end -end network. Well, it's not an end-to-end -end network. It's a network amongst networks. And large companies and large ISPs have their own massive intranets and they connect to each other. And it was that decentralized architecture in part which led to its phenomenal popularity. So it's irresistible and it's spreading. Now, it's even in the news this week, it seems, right? So what's in the news this week? What's everyone so you know, talking about? Google and China, right? What's happening in China? What's happening with Google? And many people have asked me to comment on this. Now, Given that my role, and I'll, given that my role as, a, as the president and CEO of ICANN, what do you think an appropriate response would be? I would offer that the appropriate response is quite simple. It's none of my business, okay, what these issues are. And that alone, that, this story of how critical the Google and China issue is to many parties and why it doesn't engage us at ICANN will help you want to understand a little bit about ICANN's role in the Internet ecosystem and the governance system. 
Because one way to look at the internet is to simplify it. Okay, the engineers like to talk about seven layers, OSI layers, but none of those are absolute layers because all boundaries get blurred in technology and networking. So I like to simplify it and talk about the internet as a three layer cake. The bottom layer of that cake are the pipes and the plumbing. It's either the fiber optic lines, the copper lines, the cable lines, or the wireless, things that get messages and signals around. So pipes and plumbing, the bottom layer of the cake. The middle layer is traffic and routing. Okay, how do you get messages from point A to point B? The top layer is everything that resides on top of the internet. You think of it content, tent, application, and data. And the discussion about what it's alleged that China did and discussions about Google's experience are about that top layer of the cake, right? It's about the content and the application layer and the data layer, okay? ICANN is not engaged in that layer. ICANN is engaged in the domain name system which is in the, a part of the middle layer of that cake. The middle layer of that cake is about traffic and routing. So if the internet is a network of networks, and we all want to be connected, we want to share messages from one another around the world, or move information and move data files, how are those going to get around? Well, there had to be a way to connect the devices. And so the devices were identified with addresses that were numbers, okay, when you think of like, 168.198.155.120, or whatever the number might be. Those are internet addresses. That's how the devices talk. Now, we don't think about that most of the time, right? Because what do we think about? For the web, we're thinking about domain names, right? And we type in a domain name, OK? By the way, there's about 200 million domain names in the world, 180 to 200 million domain names, roughly, at present. Well, if everyone could just do any domain names they wanted, OK, and there was no coordination, right? Well, then there would be multiple CSIS.orgs. Okay, there'd be, and, and, and they could be pointing in many different directions, many different places, and no one would know which one's the right one. So to have, to have cohesion and unity in that system, there has to be a coordination body to, to run a set of processes so that every name is unique and every address is unique to avoid confusion, to avoid conflict, to avoid redundancies. And it's a very subtle role, very subtle, and, uh, and yet uh, an important part of the overall process and one of the few quasi-centralized functions in the internet. Because everything else is decentralized. I mean, who do you have to ask permission to to buy a new cell phone and use a network or to go buy a PC and plug it in? You don't have to ask anybody's permission. You plug it in. You can add a switch. You can add a router. You can add a subnet. You can do whatever you want because it's decentralized. And that's why this system won. Other network architectures, and, and you can even th think of the local area network experience. Some of you might think of token rings or star networks. Those required a central administrator to manage them very carefully and how they grew and who got to use what. The internet had, didn't need that. All it needed was some integrity in the namespace and address space so there wouldn't be, uh, wouldn't be conflict. So ICANN is the body that was created over time to coordinate the domain names and addresses. Now, of course, ICANN is only 11 years old, and the internet is roughly 40 years old if we look back to the DARPANET. So where did it all start? Where did keeping the addresses and the names start? It started on a little 3 by 5 piece of paper card in that gentleman's pocket, Bob Kahn's. Okay? And Bob did that for a number of years when the DARPANET was running until I guess the card got overfilled and he got tired of doing it. So he recruited Dr. John Postel to do that work for him. And Dr. John Postel at the time uh, was in Los Angeles. In fact, in an office, uh, he, he worked in an office right that, where ICANN still has offices a day. So he ran that function for years and the internet scaled. And he had to develop a set of practices to resolve disputes because people would start fighting over domain names. All right? And he had to come up with very artful methods to let other people resolve those disputes and processes and come back to him with a joint solution if there was a, a disagreement somewhere in the world. And he, so he kept a list of all the addresses and he kept a list of the names. And what happened was then we're in a, we're, we're, you know, we happen to be in America, but we're in the modern world. So what do you think happens when people had all these disputes over names? Well, eventually someone sued. And I believe he was at USC at that time, at the Information Sciences Institute. They got hit with a lawsuit. How would you feel if you're a university and you're a nonprofit and businesses are suing you about internet domain names? 
you probably wouldn't be very amused. The second lawsuit was either filed or, or announced, and USC said, we're done. <laughs> we're done. We don't need to be in the middle of this dogfight anymore. Ergo, I can. Okay? ICANN was created to be the institution that would handle that incredibly difficult role of running a set of processes to manage domain names and manage internet addresses for the global internet so it could keep growing. And ICANN was, was created by the United States government who realized that this ecosystem was developing because the internet was so decentralized there were all these different parties already popping up. And not only the ISPs, but parties allocating addresses, and the regional internet ed registries came up, and the registrar, uh, 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 there were different, different parties involved. And so this ecosystem was growing up, and the, and the United States government, after a lot of debate and discussion in the community of different models that could be, that, that could be put forward, decided to create ICANN as a nonprofit, multi-stakeholder body to govern the name and addressing piece or coordinate that piece of the internet. And actually there's four functions in ICANN. There's the coordination of global domain names. I mentioned there are roughly 180 million names. The coordination of network addresses. There's about 4 billion potential addresses under IPv4. And there's roughly 300 trillion, trillion, trillion addresses under IPv6. And ICANN has a role to allocate addresses at the central, as a central authority. ICANN has a role as a coordinator uh, to help coordinate the domain name system. The domain name system is what converts when you're sitting in a browser and if you type in uh, a, a name, let's just say you know, gizmo.com, whatever name you might type in, gets translated to a network address. And there's a set of software, some of which resides on your computer or your phone, some of which is at your ISP, and some of which are, are at what are called root server operators. That set of software and the databases of all these 100 million names and the addresses that they correspond to is called the domain name system. Okay, that's the system that's exercised roughly a trillion times a day as we collectively humans look at about 100 billion web pages a day, many of which have many different embedded links, so it leads to multiple DNS transactions, domain name system transactions. We send tens of billions of emails, tens of billions of SMS or short messages, Plus, the Internet's doing all of the kinds of transactions on supply side, all kinds of network communications, uh, telephone calls, fax messages. So there's an enormous amount of transactions that are, that are taking place. The domain name system is that which you don't see that works in the background that connects the pieces. Was the domain name system developed by ICANN? No. No. It was designed by the Internet Engineering Task Force, which has been around for over 25 years, which develops the standards and the technology. But it has to be operated, it's mostly run by ISPs or in, and other service providers and by the root zone operators. But ICANN has a role in working with all of them and in driving the policies and the coordination globally. So that's the third thing ICANN does. So it's names, network addresses, domain name system. And finally, we have a role as a publisher and a service in, uh, entity for the internet standards. Uh, the assignments of the protocol and parameters in the registries. So there's a lot of different internet devices uh, and standards that have different capabilities. So for example, port 80 on your computer is generally used for HTTP in the web. Okay? Well, that assignment is made by the IETF, but someone has to, to publish a set of databases that hold that centrally for the world. And different bodies could do it. IETF doesn't, isn't a body at present. Okay? IETF is still an Internet Engineering Task Force. So it was determined that, that a body needed to hold that and publish it. That's, another, that's the fourth service um, that ICANN provides as an, as an organization. So, so what is ICANN like? And then we're going to talk more about the, the ecosystem with the different parties. In a way, ICANN is like a, a, how many people have heard of Second Life? Ever heard of Second Life? Yeah. So ICANN is a little bit like a, a, a miniature island virtual nation state or city state in Second Life that's called domain name them. Okay? And it's in charge of domain names and addresses. And then it's funny because it, it's virtual, so it kind of exists in this virtual place, but then it contracts with people on the internet. Uh, around the world. All the country code registries, countries are involved, the other internet registries and the registrars. So it's also a contracting body, uh, but the internet's a very virtual place. So it's really hard to say, uh, you know, what's, what's there. I mean, if, if Virginia uh, Woolf were to, to describe the internet, what might she say? 
And I, I think what she'd say is, there's no there there. Okay? It's everywhere, and yet there's no there there. Because it's so decentralized. It's so incredibly distributed. And it's also why a lot of people confuse ICANN as being in all of internet governance or internet governance, when, it, when in fact ICANN is coordination and policy and some operations on names, addresses, the domain name system, and the protocols and, and parameters. But the issue is there's not much else in that they're their kind of virtual place. There's not much else there, you know, except other policies at national levels and state levels and different places around the world that touch on, on parts of the internet. So when you look at the internet as a whole, because it's so decentralized, the only thing that was needed was that piece of three by five card telling everybody where everyone else was in case they wanted to contact in, in terms of a centralized coordinated resource. So that's, that's how uh, ICANN, ICANN was created. And so when we, when we begin to look at this thing, there's, there's very funny aspects that are happening because the internet keeps growing, the adoption, roughly 100 million people a year are coming onto the internet. So during our discussion for about an hour today, 11,000 human beings that have never touched or uh, that have never used the internet before will be using the internet on computers for the first time in their life. There'll be net additions this hour. And everyone else who quit using it because they retired or they passed away or went off on an island or anything else, they're replaced as well. So there's a net 11,000 added every single hour of every day just on the computer-based internet network and considerably more on the telephone network. So it keeps expanding as this massive network of network. And as T.S. Eliot, Eliot wrote once, between the idea and the reality and between the motion and the act falls the shadow. And ICANN is a little bit like the shadow. So we rest in the shadow. We're not clearly understood by the wider internet. And so I'll explain a little bit of, of how it works beyond the functions. So as an organization, we were created to be multi-stakeholder. You know, so what does that mean? Well, what it means is when the, the parties sat down and said, how do we get the different parties that have a stake in this game together, they identified some major constituencies or major categories of constituencies. Uh, one were the, the people that are in the domain name business. And so they decided to create the domain name supporting organization, the DNSO, which today became the GNSO, or the generic name supporting organization. Because then soon countries were involved and said, well, we don't really want to be with all those business folks over there. You know, we're country code operators. So there was another group co created called the country code names supporting organization. And so that's the constituency of the operators of .UK for the United Kingdom, .CA for Canada, .JO for Jordan, .JP for Japan. And those operators were chosen by Postel based upon their ability to be leaders in their community and collaboration and getting all these networks connected in the country. So very often they were in the academic environment. They were professors or they were running a lab or they were system administrators at universities. Sometimes they were private com companies. Sometimes they were government offices. So we have, the, we have the, the names group, generic name supporting organization. We have the country code supporting uh, organization of the countries. But then we have addresses. And network addresses uh, were handed out by this group called regional internet registries. Today, there's five of those around the world. There's one here in North America, Aaron. Uh, there's one in Europe. Uh, there's one in Asia Pacific. There's one in Latin America. And the most recent one is in Africa. ICANN allocates blocks of these IP addresses, of which there's about 4 billion in, in IPv4. We only have about 10% left, by the way. We ran past the 90% mark two weeks ago. So we have less than, we have about 380 million network addresses left, dropping quite quickly. Depending upon which forecast model you use and how game theory plays out as it gets depleted, you know, it's probably somewhere between a 12-month and 36-month time frame that ICANN has to allocate those that then go to the RIRs that then are allocating and distributing them uh, through the system. There's, there's more than enough IPv6 addresses to last for the foreseeable future, having said that the future is fundamentally unforeseeable on the Internet. Because when, when uh, they came up with the standard for IPv4, everyone thought 4.3 billion internet addresses, you know, that'll, that should last us at least 100 years, you know, or some huge amount of time. And of course, the internet has faced this exponential growth. So there's those groups. But that's not the, and, and, and then under, for example, the gener generic name supporting organization, there are multiple constituencies, such as the registrars 
constituency, those that register uh, domain names uh, for you. So, and there's registries such as the .com registry or the .dot uh, uh, .info or .dot .biz or .dot .tel, uh, and so there's sets of different constituencies there. And then there's other advisory groups to the board. So governments wanted to be involved. ICANN needed governments involved. So ICANN created the Government Advisory Committee that reports to the board of ICANN that now has over 90 members. And most fortuit fortuitously, uh, the week before or two days before I was elected as the uh, uh, CEO of ICANN, China rejoined the Government Advisory Committee for the first time since the year 2000. So China was back at the table, and we value China as a partner because China has 300 million users of the Internet, okay? And China is an important part of that global fabric of the domain name system, and we have to keep everyone collaborating in that space to keep that system neutral and to keep it, keep it working. And uh, in December, Russia joined as well. And so effectively, every significant, every superpower and other top country in the world is now uh, a member of the Government Advisory Committee of ICANN, which advises the board. Uh, we also have the Security and Stability Advisory Committee, which focuses on the security of the domain name system and trying to uh, develop different approaches and policies for buttressing that. And the root uh, server security. Uh, uh, and uh, stability and advisory committee, what we call RSAC. Those advise the board. The board of ICANN itself is a multi-stakeholder body. The board is elected by these different groups and constituencies inside of it. So in, in some ways, the board's a little bit like a multicameral legislator. It also has liaison seats from the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force, liaison from the root server community, ICANN, by the way, incidentally, is also one of the 13 root operators in the world today. Um, uh, and there's others spread around the United States and, uh, and around the world. Uh, so ICANN was created as, and ICANN's gone through major, two major structural reforms internally, changing this internal constituency structure to evolve it. Uh, and the last one we're just going through right now, and it's called the GNSO or the Generic Name Supporting Organization Restructuring, and it was meant to create new constituencies as well, and creating ways for non-commercial groups, such as whether it's privacy advocates or uh, cr crime and law enforcement, so different kinds of communities could get formed that are not so, uh, businesses, so to speak, uh, in the domain name uh, business. So a major, major change. It was worked on for years, and it comes up. It's bottom-up. It's a bottom-up process. So to develop new pro policies in ICANN, you have to introduce it down in these constituencies or in the policy process, which, like any legislative process, tends to take a number of years to develop. Some things are quicker. Something takes years and years and years. So many of you may know that the international domain names were introduced uh, in December, and that means that because until the present time, right, if you wanted to use the internet, what did you have to type your domain name in, at least the top level domain? And what we think of as English or Latinate characters. Okay, dot, so, so for China, the symbol was dot .cn, okay, or for Russia, dot .ru, even though their own language uh, Cyrillic or, or Chinese and their character set use different keyboards. And what this means is that those international users have had to switch their keyboard modes. So anyway, I, I'm, IDNs are an example. They're very popular, international domain names. So the Russian uh, uh, Federation will be introducing RF in their Cyrillic language. It's now been approved. It took 11 years of technical work for IETF to develop the technical standards for that. 11 years. It took ICANN seven years of policy work. You know, and a lot of people look at it and say, well, God, why didn't you just introduce this? Because there's a lot of tiny, subtle issues that impact this massive global internet that's both, that's very stable and robust in many ways, but it's also very sensitive to perturbation, and we have to keep it running, right? Because if the domain name system goes down, you know, what, what happens to our connections, right? It's gone. It's gone. And uh, there have been attacks. Last year, there were major attacks on the domain name system. And uh, Kaminsky, a software engineer, found a major vulnerability that he published, which has led to, to innovations there. But anyway, so a multi-stakeholder uh, group, it's uh, evolved twice. Um, and by the way, what do we have to do? So, so the internet's growing, and there's predicted to be another billion users on computers, and probably another couple, couple billion on cell phones. So what do we need to do to make that happen? Something really hard. We all have to stay out of the way, right? Because it's happening on its own. It's happening on its own. So we have to stay out of the way. 
And one of the things that I can and the, and the rest of our ecosystem partners have to do is stay out of the way of the internet. Because the engineers know what they're doing in developing the standards in the ITF and moving that forward. The ISP, ISPs know how to run their networks. They don't need someone else to tell them how to do their job. Uh, and so the system, part of the delicate balance is developing enough policies and procedures for things to move forward without slowing the system down. So the other thing is, you know, this platform that we're becoming so dependent upon, it's also asymmetrical, which mentions is a great challenge because, uh, you know, if you look at the cyber field as one example, uh, it's generally stated that offense is about a thousand times easier than defense. Well, that has major, major implications for all major nation states in the world because it means that small groups of cyber criminals and hackers can potentially uh, become terrorists towards their information and assets. And for the banking system, the same thing. The, the most creative work in the world in terms of hacking is often uh, in uh, third world countries in many places where you have highly educated engineers and people who want to make money and see that it's, it's easy to make a pretty good income, maybe even get rich breaking into financial banking systems. Um, so it's, it's a, a very sensitive system. So let's talk about the, the virtual and the global. So EU Commissioner Redding recently said that the real world and the virtual world are, are converging. And what she said was the exponential increase of information, the further development of social networks, and the accelerated growth of online video traffic, and the emergence of the internet things will progressively cause the online and the real world to become interlinked. And that's happening everywhere. Now, what other problems do we face as a planet that are a bit like this internet challenge and the internet governance challenge? Well, global warming. It's a common resource, you know. Uh, oxygen at a planet at a certain temperature is kind of a common resource. And the only way to solve global warming, it appears, is global collaboration. Same is true of, of many of the environmental and ecosystem problems. And so it's not the only thing we're dealing with where we're challenged to collaborate around the world as, as we've never seen before. So the other thing is if we look at the ICANN system, ICANN's just one part of the ecosystem. The other key parts we talked about were the Internet Engineering Task Force. Another key part is the ISOC, or the Internet Society, which convenes groups around the world of Internet users and others and helps does do capacity building. And ISOC operates the .org registry. Uh, which generates profits, and with that they help to fund the IETF, and also a bit the W3, W3C. W3C is the World Wide Web Consortium, which is a different standards group that governs the browser technology and standards and develops them. Now, who's in charge? So who's in charge of this, this thing? I think you know the answer, right? Who's in charge? <laughs> I am. OK. Um, well, I wrote a book about this. And what the book said, yeah, the second chapter of the book was facetiously titled uh, uh, The President of the Internet. And uh, it was titled that because there's not one, okay? Because the Internet is so decentralized that everything is about collaboration. And even ICANN in its role of, of, of helping to create the, 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 the root zone file of the Internet each day, okay, uh, and updating the root zone file uh, entries, uh, that's a collaborative process. And those, those changes, the key changes and redelegations are approved by the multi-stakeholder board. And those then propagate out through its servers. But guess what? That's a tiny little file. I think someone told me today it's roughly 119 KB. And if my math is right, here's how small a 119 KB file is. If you take a DVD, we all watch DVDs, it's 4.7 gigabytes. You could put 38 million copies of the Internet Root Zone on one DVD that you put in your DVR. 38 million, that's, so it's 1 38 millionth of the, the root zone is tiny. Because all it is is a, actually let me explain what the root zone is for a second. Uh, what the root zone is, is, and I'm gonna do an analogy of, uh, of, of the internet. Let's look at an aspen grove for a second. How many people have seen an aspen grove in Colorado or the mountains here or somewhere else? How many root systems, how many different trees is an aspen grove? It's one, it's one tree. So it's all interconnected. It looks like different trees got different trunks. An aspen grove is one tree. It's got one root system, and then it's got these different trees that come up, and they have lots of leaves. So we'll do an analogy with the internet. ICANN coordinates the root zone file. It is actually just says the name of every tree and its address. Okay, for .com, here's the network address today. That's that aspen tree there. Okay, we've got .fr for France. That tree is called .fr, and it's got this address today. It's about 270 of those. It has to be precise to keep the internet working, but it's kind of points to these 270 aspen trees in a grove. Each tree is a registry 
okay? It's a registry. It's like .com or .fr, and the registry could register hundreds of thousands or millions uh, of names. .com has about 80 million. That's the leaves on the .com tree. And those leaves then point to your servers or your website or whatever they're, they're uh, pointing to on the web that a user is creating if they're utilized. So the root file is just that little piece in the bottom. And I can, as government governance process, uh, focuses on that. Um, the other thing I just want to mention briefly is the affirmation of commitment. So if you look at ICANN as this governance body and a part of that system, and I mentioned ISOC, I mentioned IETF, WC3, there's many other players, the root zone operators, the RIRs, it goes on and on and on. Okay? No one's strictly in control. But one party has to control the creation of the root for quality control and to, to avoid the, the, uh, the, the, the conflict. So if, if you look at the affirmation agreement and what ICANN's undergoing over time, is the internet, when it was created by Dr. Khan and others, was a 100% US creation in some ways. It was funded as an American defense project for this network for information sharing. It's arcing over time. It's becoming 100% global. And that's how it's spreading. And I'm talking now about the physical network, the pipes and the plumbing. It's spreading out globally everywhere. There's no country in the world that I know of where the internet's not present day. It's, it's in all countries and territories. And it's permeating. It's going farther. So it's going 100% global. Now, ICANN was created in the U.S. Originally, the U.S. ran the internet functions through DARPA. And then John Postel was doing it and different parties doing different pieces. But it, and, and, and control kept moving and becoming global and more global and more global. ICANN, as well, has to move on that arc. ICANN has to swing on that arc from being a U.S. created entity to continually being more and more integrated with its global multi-stakeholders. It's, this isn't philosophy. It's in the contract that forms us, and it's even in the affirmation of commitments. The affirmation of commitments, which was a new agreement with the government that said, U.S. government, saying we'll no longer report to you every year, we'll report to the whole world. And the affirmation in it said, you have to be responsible to the global public interest. The global public interest. So, ICANN is following that arc in some sense, uh, and an and American having created it has a very special role, which a lot of parties question, of course, around the world, because they wish they had that special role, or they want to see it shared, or they want to see it changed. But a, a incredible value-added role the United States has played is creating an international multi-stakeholder organization and protecting it, and allowing it to be multi-stakeholder, allowing it to be international, and run these collaboration processes so effectively. And in the history of the root zone updates that ICANN's been involved in for 11 years, there's one alleged instance that's not confirmed that the U.S. government once changed one entry uh, into the root zone, which, which uh, didn't happen, but it's alleged. So the United States has created this thing, given it to the world, and created ICANN to embody that coordination piece, been very successful. The board of ICANN that elected me had 15 members and uh, 10 of those, or 11 of those, were from around the world, and only four from the United States. Or more broadly, with liaisons, there were 21. Six from the United States, 15 from around the world. So it's truly an international phenomenon. And it has to keep in that neutral place, which is why, if you look at, even again, the cybersecurity problem, ICANN has to stay neutral, because when botnet attacks happen, someone has to be focusing on protecting the domain name system globally. Because if that goes down, we all get hurt. And so it's, a, so it's a great collaborative effort, and, and it's important that we, that we keep uh, uh, that role. And under the new affirmation agreement, we committed as an organization to enhance our accountability, account, uh, enhance our transparency, and have an international review group participate in doing those reviews, as well as reviews of our security and stability plans, a separate review process, reviews of our con consumer choice and competition. When ICANN was created, in the commercial area of domain names, there was one registry, effectively, okay, and one registrar that had been effectively created by the U.S. government through a contract. ICANN was created to create competition. Today, there's 270 different distinct technical registries. There's over 14 major commercial operators. Does anyone know how many registrars there are? Over 900. So the ecosystem's gone from being you know, one player, one registrar, one registry to, to 900. So if we look at the future, some of the questions you know, that we need your help to think about you know, and, and where we go is how do we evolve this model? And, and because it's a, it's a question the community is always asking internationally. 
uh, because it started in the room as we talked about it. It's moved to different people. It's moved into ICANN, and, and ICANN is, continues to evolve. And there are those who do not think that a multi-stakeholder model should, should uh, drive this collaboration. They believe it should be a government, one government or an interna international government organization. And they feel that government should be fully in control of the internet. There's other people that are very concerned, maybe even horrified at that prospect because the internet has been evolving so rapidly and has thrived on this multi-stakeholder uh, environment where governments are a part of the process but don't control the whole process. Who knows what the right answer is? We're in a new, we're in a new virtual place in the world. We're in a, we're with a new problem set, with a new challenge. Uh, in, the, in the technical level, the size of this network, uh, our, our mutual dependence, and what's its primary use? It's commerce, you know? The primary use, we talk about cyber problems. Cyber problems are very small compared to the incredible value add uh, in the economy and the communications of, of what's going on. And by the way, another uh, governance group I wanted to mention that's critical in this picture is the Internet Governance Forum which has provided a very important platform for sharing and debate and dialogue. The UN has hosted that as a meeting, as a platform, but with many different parties uh, taking part. So, you know, we look at the, the future as we internationalize and as we change with IDNs and supporting the different language scripts, which is important in offering new services uh, and, and expanding around the world. But one of the questions is, you know, if you had a blank slate, you know, if we wipe the whiteboard clean, Knowing what we know today, in 2010 instead of 1999, how would we shape and form this organization? Okay, so you could do the blank slate approach, blank slate. Another approach would be the 100 mile an hour approach. Maybe 1,000 mile an hour would be more appropriate. The internet's flying down the street at 100 miles an hour, okay? It's a car that's going 100 miles an hour. The wheels are spinning. How do you want to change the tire? How do you want to enhance it? One thing you want to do is you want to keep it going, right? We want to keep it going. Okay, and it is working, and that's actually the miracle of it all, is that this decentralized network is spreading everywhere, it's connecting everyone, and it's had virtually 100% uptime for, for 40 years with very isolated outages in sub-networks and pieces. And the domain name system has had 100% uptime since ICANN was created. So the system's working, so we shouldn't break that, but where do we go, and how do we continue to build the global buy-in that's necessary? How do we make it fair and equitable? How do we make it uh, uh, inclusive and also expansive and continue the richness of the policy process? And we don't know the answer. We have to work on it together. The ICANN community has just gone through another uh, revolution, but there's a new, the, and the affirmation was another big change as a result of the voice being heard internationally. Department of Commerce, who's been a fantastic partner to ICANN, they created ICANN. They've been very uh, supportive of ICANN's role. Uh, and Assistant Secretary Strickling and his new team are excellent. They understand the internet. They understand what we're trying to do, and they're fully respectful of the role that they have uh, in dealing with ICANN, that we have to remain an international body serving the world. So we're very appreciative. But where does that go? Because that relationship will go through an evolution. It's gone through different contracts and agreements. And the IANA contract, the fundamental agreement that helped to create ICANN's uh, 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 authorities in names and addresses, will expire in September of 2011. That's very concerning to a lot of countries, OK? <laughs> That's very concerning because you have a multi-stakeholder body that's, that's signing decades-long agreements and the underlying contract could be gone. But of course, what we hope is going to happen, and it's not for me to say what's going to happen because on the one hand, I represent a multi-stakeholder community in some fashion I represent as a CEO and president, and in another fashion, we're a contractor to the U.S. government. Uh, and uh, it's not for us to specify that contract, but there needs to be a global dialogue. All of your thoughts are needed and people around the world to think about how can, this, how can the model be improved in the next iteration of the next step? How do we enhance the buy-in? How do we enhance the, the, the responses? How do we enhance the, the, the investment in security? And one other thing I want to mention is, for example, we're considering developing a DNS cert. There's a lot of certs in the world for computer emergency uh, response teams. Uh, and some people are saying, oh, there needs to be a DNS cert. Well, maybe. We don't know. We're not sure. We think it could add value, but it's got to go through the discussions and the stakeholder process. So there's a lot of open questions, and as I said, we, I, as I said when I when I today, I didn't have the answers, uh, but we're all connected by this. 
We're going to be connected by this network for the rest of our lives. It's going to be what we leave for our children and our children's children. And the beauty is we get to help design and shape its stewardship as it goes forward for the next decade or two. So it's going to be an exciting time of evolution. And uh, I thank you all very much for this. And I hope we just keep one thing in mind, and that is one world, one internet, and everyone connected. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. Well, that was great. Um, and you know, I was a little surprised you didn't mention the book. I saw it here. I forgot to mention it, too. Maybe that should be one of the first questions. But instead, I was going to ask, and we'll open the floor for questions. Please wait till the microphone gets there. I, of course, will ignore my own instructions. But, Rod, maybe you can tell us, you've laid out a really good overview of what's going on. You've laid out all the issues. What's your agenda for the next year? What do you think the big issues are? What, what is it you want to see accomplished in your first year as the, as the head? Sure. Uh, we've got a very full strategic plan. And one of the most important things are these international domain names because other countries and people have wanted to do that without switching keyboard modes. We just approved Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Egypt, and Russia last week. We've got 12 more applications of the pipeline. We just signed a new arrangement with UNESCO. We're hoping to get a lot more countries and languages coming in. So that's a strategic priority. Uh, ICANN was created to create competition and also new top-level domains. And a, a, a very controversial and important topic are, are what we call generic uh, top-level domains. And there's many different economic interests around that. We're running a process to introduce those. And we have a whole set of security stability issues, the domain names uh, uh, SEC uh, system, which you actually advocated, I think, very strongly in your report, Jim, um, we're, we will be going live with uh, in, in a few months. We're actually in test mode on the route, the stealth route that's already got a digitally signed uh, secure system. That's great. Thanks. Do we have questions? Uh, in the back. Go ahead. Hi. I'll let you Ro okay. Rod, you look like you're holding up pretty well. Uh, congratulations. Uh, Thank you. Keep Thank it you, up. Lee. We're all rooting for you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Can you give us a couple of thoughts about how I can and how all of us balance quality control and the other governance imperatives with the imperative to stay out of the way? Sure. It, the, you know, the first part of quality control that you know, I worried about is, as a CEO coming in was the IANA function. Okay, because I mean that's the, in the IANA. I, I'm sorry, I'm using a, an acronym. It's it's one of the capabilities that we do of updating the internet root zone every day. Okay, and that has a zero tolerance for error, because if you make an error in that, some part of the world gets left out of the domain name system. Okay, and they can't be accessed by the rest of the system until you fix that problem, which we haven't, you know, uh, thank goodness uh, is, is not a, a recurring event. So the IANA function is a top priority and making sure we have an IANA excellence effort. And, uh, and I've been looking very hard at the resiliency and what we could do to enhance the resiliency of that function in decentralizing operations, because that's got to be absolutely rock solid. We've also got, we've got TQM uh, activities in many different areas, whether it's the, the new GTLD program, for example, for the top level domains. It's a separate office that's you know, got a Chinese wall separate, a whole TQM effort around that. International domain names, you know, after the seven years of work, we finally got the policy approvals. We've now got the application processing shop up. So there's nuts and bolts uh, back in, Lee, that we're working on. And uh, quality across the board, the key is keeping the internet going and making that domain name system uh, make sure that it's running. Thank you. Bill Corwin, uh, Rod, uh, like every new CEO, you like the one two blocks down Pennsylvania Avenue, you you inherit a heritage from your predecessor, controversies and, and benefits, and uh, after a short honeymoon, you own it and it's uh, it's yours. Certainly, the biggest controversy going on in ICANN since June 2008 has been the new GTLD proposal. Without asking you whether you would have done anything differently up to now. Uh, came out of the Seoul meeting with at least the perception, though not a firm promise from ICANN, that uh, the application period is perceived will open the beginning of next year. It's likely that new ones will be added uh, by the end of the year. Do you think that, do you expect to see new GTLDs introduced to the root zone by the end of 20, 
11, and perhaps more important, uh, drilling down a little bit, what are the most important potential benefits for the internet and users, and, and what are some of the risks, and what is ICANN doing to address those risks? Sure. So, Phil, if I sum it up, talking about new GTLD timing issues, and you know, what does that look like, and then what might the benefits be of, of new offerings that are out there? Uh, clearly, huge priority for ICANN, something it's worked on for years. The first is, I, I have not, and we have not committed any dates right now, because of the bottom-up process, and the fact that the way ICANN and this ecosystem works, the board, as this sort of multi-camera legislator, Lature, has to do the final approvals. And we have six different threads that are running now uh, through uh, iteration processes to get to the point where the, the new applications could be received, which is one of the reasons uh, at, for the new generic top-level domains. An example would be uh, people have talked about a dot New York, you know, or a dot Paris, uh, and many brand owners and others might add new top-level domains. And I'm not advocating specific domains here, just mentioning examples. Uh, so. What we're, my commitment as CEO is to run those processes with our team very effectively. They're open to public comment. They're open to board comment, revision, and changes. So I, I have no specific time frame estimate because it, that'd be like uh, uh, Assistant Secretary Strickling or someone saying when Congress is going to get something approved. You know, I don't know. I don't know when the board's going to approve it. I know that we can deliver the information they need and support the public process. Now, what's the benefit of these new uh, top-level domains? Well, those benefits uh, can be varied. The, the newest top-level domain we've added uh, is dot .post, and that's for the international postal system. They intend to help people have unique uh, Internet uh, names and addresses that can get linked to their physical world addresses and also do financial services globally in a unique secured top level domain. So uh, most of the top level domains, you can go and join.com or, you know, or .net or, or another uh, domain and you don't have to commit to security standards. .post will only let national postal systems join. So they're going to have a high secure domain, look at some new services. That innovation is what we think is going to come, Phil, and we don't know how it's going to come and which ones it might come from, but the history of the internet is if you open up systems and you set up fair rules, most parties are good. And then you have to start structuring the incentive structures and the processes to try to stop behaviors that are, that are not beneficial. So we'll see. I'm Bob Hershey. I'm a consultant. Uh, what is being done to help hold meetings over the internet? Uh, great question. Again, if we go back to the three-layer cake, uh, we're kind of at the, at, the traf at the traffic piece in the middle. Those meetings depend upon high, high bandwidth in the pipes and plumbing and good, better applications uh, and services being developed at the top level. So we're not uh, directly engaged in that, although presumably the people offering services uh, will have domain names they're going to use. So we'll see. Thank you. Have you got time for one or two more questions? Sure, absolutely. Uh, Jonathan Zook from the Association for Competitive Technology. Um, what, uh, why are you talking to this audience is the question that comes to my head. What, what is the agenda here in Washington? What is it that people that aren't regulars at ICANN meetings, what message do they need to get and what process do they need to become engaged in uh, to advance the objectives or to begin to answer the questions that you raise? Excellent. Well, I'm here because I'm honored to be invited by uh, Jim Lewis, great thinker in this space. I can say that, that we at ICANN and I think other members of the Internet ecosystem would like to see more thoughts on where we go in the future. I mean, ICANN, as a part of that system, will be facing a major new con contract renewal with the U.S. government, Department of Commerce, in about two years' time. And so Jim and others were talking about, well, Rod, you know, what's going to happen? And I said, well, really, you know, that's not something we're, we will be part of the discussion, but a lot of thinking is needed, and, and, and generally, the Department of Commerce opens up to thoughts and ideas, and the U.S. government does, but it helps to have very smart people thinking about these issues, about where do we need to evolve in this uh, ecosystem in the future, and we thought that having those thought processes here uh, through CSIS, which is a nonpartisan or bipartisan and international group now, uh, having evolved out of its original uh, American mission, was one good place to have an uh, excellent place to have that dialogue start. Uh, but we hope that these kind of conversations will hap happen in other capitals around the world as well. So we'd like the policy wonks, strategists, technologists to think about where should the system be going. Because again, we don't have the answers. You know, it's, we're all evolving into this new space and things are flying very quickly.
I, I know I'm totally good. I'm open. I'm 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 open. My back end is later, so I'm great. It's terrific. Thanks. Um, Derek Cogburn from American University um, uh, School of International Service and uh, the Internet Governance Project. Uh, just one thought. Um, I wonder if you could say a little bit about how you're looking at the multi-stakeholder arrangements around the Internet Governance Forum. So if you could say a little bit about, just to make sure that this audience is aware of that, but just your thoughts on how that has evolved, how useful it's been for the kinds of issues that you're raising. Sure. Well, and, and I'm still learning about the Internet Governance Forum. Uh, I had the, you know, I should explain, you know, I have, you know, a, a, my background was a high-tech you know, CEO, and then about 15 years in policy, it was mostly environmental policy, uh, and then some diplomacy uh, and track two d diplomatic work, and then cybersecurity. So I'm new to Internet Governance. Uh, I had the great opportunity to attend the IGF meeting in Egypt, which was wonderful. And what, it, what really struck me was the richness of the dialogues and how many different sessions there were, whether it was on child pornography concerns and law enforcement and nonprofits coming together or cybersecurity concerns or online video conferencing or VoIP or capacity building in the development world. What really struck me was this incredible richness. And I think that what's so unique and important about the IGF uh, as a UN-sponsored multi-stakeholder dialogue platform is it's not decisional. Okay, so I mean, we've come to an ICANN party. We've got brilliant people like Phil and others, you know, haggling over where policy lines are going to be drawn and, 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 and things are going to end up. There's not that same uh, issue at IGF because it's really concepts, ideas, information sharing uh, to help shape uh, policies long term in, in the future. So it creates, I think, a very different kind of environment than the ICANN meetings. We have a similar number. We're, we'll be in Nairobi in about a month. We'll have about uh, roughly somewhere between 700 and 1,000 people uh, roughly talking about policies and where we go specifically and names and addresses and DNS and things that touch that. So I think they're very complimentary and we would very much like to see the IGF continue as a multi-stakeholder platform. I already have it. Rod, thank you for a very enlightening uh, uh, talk. Uh, clearly, uh, communication is one of your talents. Thank you. Um, thank you, Bob. I wanted to ask a question about the global public interest that you mentioned, mm -hmm. and specifically, uh, who gets to decide and what that really is. Uh, if you had been at the uh, any of the two world summits, uh, as you probably know, there was quite a bit of discussion there. Is this on? There was quite a bit of discussion there about the role of ICANN. Many of the countries even raised questions about its legitimacy. Sure. Uh, there is still a lot of question about it around the world and, and the question of how you deal with things going forward. How do you reconcile the notion of the global public interest, as you stated, in the context of all of this, I call it discord among some countries in the world, about the role of ICANN and its legitimacy? <coughs> Sure. Thank you. So, you know, what is global public interest and you know, how do you measure it? How do you try to get there? You know, I'm not a policy wonk and I'm not an attorney. Fortunately, we have a lot of brilliant, brilliant members from those constituencies in our ICANN community. But as soon as we were working on the affirmation agreement and uh, that language came in and it was introduced by Commerce, I looked it up in uh, Wikipedia. Okay, and what I found immediately was there's many different definitions of public interest. Some parties will say, you know, it's about the economic, what's in the best interest of the public from an economic standpoint. And that leads to a, simple, uh, a certain set of decisions. Others would say it has to, has to have other social factors included, equity and justice and this and that. So any of these terms, of course, can be quite expansive. And I think that's a discussion and debate that we're very open to and we hope is going to take place across the ecosystem forums. What does that mean about who gets to decide? Well, it's a bottom-up process. And again, everything that can get resolved in the policy process in the constituencies in ICANN will come from them in a clear constituency and go up to the board for approval. Generally, if the board does not see a conflict between those guidelines and the rest of the bylaws and the other body of policies that have been approved, then they'll approve it. They may debate it. Uh, if, on the other hand, you have a situation like we have right now on some what's called vertical integration issues of how should registrars and registries, which are different businesses, be able to buy or sell each other or cross-invest, et cetera, the question's coming up with new GTLDs that it could restructure the industry, and the community split. There was a huge debate in Seoul, and Lily drew the hands in the room after a two-hour debate, and it was 50-50. Okay, and we try to get the room to budge and move, and, there, and, and what it was is different views, 
on an economic interest. And in that kind of a case, and many of the participants at the table had an economic stake. So they were interested in their business interests and they were representing those, which is their appropriate role. The board's role, when they'll review that, in part lack of a recommendation from the community, needs to think about what's in the public interest. So not what side A or side B is saying, what seems to be in the global public interest, this elusive concept that we've all got to work on. But it's something that uh, we're all going to school on. And we'll look forward to, to your input on as well, Bob. Pete Chutley from Brookings. Just like to follow up that question. What would you say would be the major foreign criticisms of the U.S. dominance of ICANN presently? Okay, a number of key criticisms. I mean, one is simply it feels not equitable. Okay, so one country has created the system, and they have a right to review the review uh, the, the root file every day. Why don't we get to do that? So it's kind of a sense of equity. Secondly, there's there's a concern of vulnerability. Some some countries are concerned that I mean, you know, God forbid, countries go to war. Okay, the countries do go to war. Well, they're concerned about well, could the United States or a party take them out of the internet? That's a very commonly voiced concern I've heard repeatedly in capitals around the world. And then I try to explain, well, you know, first thing is, you know, the, your overall internet's not dependent upon the root file, but, you, you know, your domain names are below, you know, your country code. Those, but, but you could talk to your ISPs and have them add it right back in. Because this thing about this little tiny file we talked about that's 119 KB, well, if someone doesn't like that one that we ship out and that goes to the root servers, well, the ISPs can, could, could change it and use a different one. In fact, that's been done, okay? It's called forking the root or duplicating the root. And there's clearly countries that are running tests on that. Some even say some countries are using those. It's one of the reasons buy-in is so important and why the rules kind of is very virtual. So that's a, a second complaint is the sense of vulnerability of, hey, our country could be taken out of the internet route. And that's vulnerability that, that, that's not acceptable to us. Uh, I think a lot of it is just uh, the, the perception of we want to we want to be a, a, a deeper part of the process. We appreciate having a voice uh, in this whole thing, but there's a sense of that that's an important control or power point in the internet, which in fact it's really quite virtual and it's driven up to this bottom up process. Um, and another complaint would be that the process for determining the country code operators is based upon the community of users in a country, not just the government. So the government's one voice. And we also look at what's industry using and saying. What are the universities saying? Because one of the, the philosophies the, that the engineers brought, the, the whole uh, philosophy of the IETF was on openness, on standards, and collaboration, and roughly equality, but with a meritocracy in terms of policy. So if you're smart, you could contribute more. Those values have persisted. So inside countries, we seek to ensure that the operators of the top level country domain are re really serving the interests of the public interests of the users. Governments have an issue with that sometimes. Most governments are fine with that, okay? But some governments feel like, no, we really want to control that ourselves. You know, we, we want to run that or we want to control it. And, and so that's, a, that's probably a third, third uh, uh, major concern that we have, and there's, there's others. I think we're down to our last two questions. So one, Noble and a, a, a consultant, but not nearly so technically proficient that I could ask an intelligent question. But I will risk sharing my thoughts as I was listening to you uh, in the form of a, an analogy that I used to, to consolidate my understanding conceptually as you went through the various steps of your of your talk and. You started with the hard drive in the beginning. Mm -hmm. I conceive of what you were saying afterwards as analogous to a big bang with a creator, Dr. Khan and others, uh, in intelligent design, creating mm -hmm. the DARPA net, then networks, mm -hmm. uh, analogous to galaxies, mm -hmm. and networks of networks universes, perhaps parallel universes, as, as, as there are in astrophysics theory. Then I conceived of the pipes and plumbing as similar to mass, the messages and routing as similar to energy, mm -hmm. 
and the application and data are similar to the information and, and logic that orders mm -hmm. the universe. And on a light final note, the uh, internet uh, leader, the Vican, is proper. Oh. <laughs> 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 I said this was a risk. I will yeah. leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> You're very good. It's certainly beautiful prose you, you use to describe the network. Final so final thank final. you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sharon McLoon. I'm a reporter with a trade publication called Intellectual Property Watch. Mm -hmm. And you had mentioned in your talk that there are less than 10% of the IPv4 addresses left and rapidly yes. dwindling. Yes. And I wondered, in your assessment, what's the global adoption right now? How is it going of the IPv6? And what is ICANN doing to encourage it? Sure. Well, in part, you know, what do we do to, to encourage it? We, we continue to try to promote and educate. Ultimately, it's up to the pipes and plumbing layer to choose what they want to do because they're the consumers of those network addresses and, and they have to make the decision. Um, so we're an advocate. We, we try to educate. Uh, we've set up all the capability. The distribution channel works. So there's, there's no obstacle for anybody who has a, a need for IPv6 addresses to get them. The registries already get them in each of the regions around the world, and they're ready to shovel them out in trillion number chunks. No problem. So there's no distribution channel issues. The adoption issues are very interesting. Um, uh, most of the routers and switches out there that have been sold in the last three years can either run in an IPv4 mode or what's called a dual stack mode where they also support IPv6, so 4 and 6. But you use a little more resources, it's a little bit slower. So there's some overhead costs to network operators. Uh, and so until you run out, there's not that much incentive because addresses are, I'm going to call them effectively free. They're not quite free because you have to be a member of an RIR to get these you know, huge allocations. But you might be a member paying $30,000 a year you know, and getting you know, 100 million names a year. So I mean, it's you know, less than a penny each. Uh, and an IPv6, it'll, it'll be even lower. So they're, they're almost free. So it's really about upgrading the software uh, in the global networking infrastructure and changing administration processes and retraining people. The other thing that's happening is, you know, what does mankind do when we have scarcity in a resource that's needed? Uh, prices will go up. So now there's secondary trading. We, do, we charge uh, nothing for addresses. We have some very minuscule services. $800,000 a year is what ICANN gets from the global RARs for all the you know, internet addresses that, that we allocate. And that doesn't even cover our, our costs of operation, of running the staff and the systems and the people to support the addressing business. And I actually do want to comment on one quick thing is, why are addresses and names handled together? Because some people have asked that. And as John Postel said, domain names are worth a lot of money, OK? And there's a lot of you know, uh, economic interest in those. Address, addresses are just a public service. And they need to be protected and they need to keep, keep, uh, be maintained as like a free public service. Or you're going to start restricting access to the internet. Okay, so part of the philosophy was keep the addresses free, whatever you do, and if you need to support operations, there's, there's a domain name business that can do that. So uh, it, we'll see how the, the uptake is quite slow. It's certainly below 2 or 3 percent, I think, of all, all systems in the world that support IPv6. We, we I can run an IPv6, most of the registries around the world. We're going to, when DNSSEC comes out mid this year, we're going to have a big education push for ISPs and, and companies and others to try to upgrade to DNSSEC and IPv6 uh, at the same time. But, you know, I, th I think it'll, it'll tend to solve itself as uh, addresses get, to, get depleted. Well, this has yeah. been a remarkable session in two ways. The first way is, of course, I think it's the only session we've ever had at CSIS where we've had both the creator and the prophet. <laughs> that, that alone, no, for, for a guy who's only been in this job a few months, you really do seem to have mastered the portfolio. So let me thank you for a fabulous presentation. Thank you. Thank all of you very much. Real honor to be here. Thank you. We're calling the state. We're calling the wow. state. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. That's a sign. You know, okay. That's a sign.